Welcome to the Financial Times coverage of the Ambrosetti Forum on the banks of Lake Como at the Villa d'Este. We have with us today Nouriel Roubini, best known for predicting the 2008 financial crisis and the collapse in the US housing market, and founder and president of Roubini Global Economics. Mr. Roubini teaches economics at the Stern School of Business at New York University. Mr. Roubini, thank you very much for talking to the Financial Times today. Good being with you. The, um, yesterday we had some very mixed uh, jobs data out of the US. Um, what is your view of how that um, affects the sort of general optimism about improving growth in the developed world? Well, certainly the economic data about employment in the US were weak and other economic data suggest that economic growth in the US is below 2%. So there is some optimism about acceleration of US growth and improvement in Europe, UK and Japan. I don't share that optimism. I think that the recovery is going to be, at best, uh, very weak. And how does that, I mean, compared to last year, the mood here at Ambrosetti is considerably more positive than it was last year. There was a very exclusive focus on the troubles in the Eurozone. Um, yesterday, you spoke on the panel about a range of risks that you see to that optimism. You've talked about the risk to growth in the US and the Eurozone. Where else do you see potential risks? But certainly there are risks in the US and the Eurozone and there are also uncertainty deriving from policy decision when the Fed is going to taper in September or not, who's going to be next chairman of the, chairman of the Fed, uh, what will be the debates about the US fiscal policy from sequester to debt ceiling to government shutdown. In the Eurozone you have a German election, the risk of an Italian government collapse and the questions about how much more integration is going to occur in Europe or not. Outside of these uh, advanced economies. Now we have emerging clouds in emerging markets, Chinese slow growth, maybe the risk of a hard landing, and now this significant slowdown of growth and financial pressure in many emerging markets. I mean, uh, many speakers, including you, have spoken of these risks in the emerging markets. Um, you spoke yesterday about a need for a further generation of structural reforms. Do you think that therefore they are not, they are still extremely vulnerable to the potential for financial crisis? Yes, they are, because some of the success of emerging market the last few years was due to uh, luck, not just to good reforms. You know, you had uh, China growth, you had the commodity super cycle, you had near zero rates and quantitative easing in advanced economies and search for yield. Now this party is over, the Fed, however, slowly is going to exit and normalize, China is slowing down, the commodity super cycle is over, and now we've realized that this country did uh, first generation of reforms, macro stability, some privatization, liberalization, but those more fundamental second generation reform, the increased productivity growth did not occur, and some of them actually now have significant macro and financial vulnerabilities. And in the same sense, their policy options are also difficult. If they raise interest rates to avoid a collapse of the currency and inflation, you're going to kill the recovery of growth, you may go into recession. If instead is monetary policy to stay in growth, you could have a free fall of the currency, rising inflation, and inability to finance large current account deficits. So, them if you do, and them if you don't. Yes, you spoke yesterday a bit about this trilemma that the, some of the emerging markets governments are facing. Is there one or two particular countries where you see those vulnerabilities as, as particularly worrying? Uh, I've counted five of them among the large emerging markets that are in trouble. These are India, Turkey, Brazil, Indonesia and South Africa. As I pointed out, they share common vulnerability in terms of twin fiscal and current account deficits, uh, weaker growth, higher inflation, and all of them are now facing either political protests in the streets or looming elections. And for all of them, these policy choices are going to be very difficult. They postponed some of the structural reforms. Some of them moved away from market-oriented reforms towards state capitalism. And if they couldn't do those reforms in good time, it's going to be even harder to make those reforms when now you have people in the streets or in the next year, you're going to have presidential or parliamentary elections. So there is a fundamental lack of policy credibility that could push their currencies, their equity markets, and their bond markets lower than they already have fallen so far. You and Ian Bremmer have spoken about the lack of global leadership and how significant that is in uh, trying in, in its impact on our recovery from the global financial crisis. Uh, you've spoken less of a G20 or a G8 than a G0 wor world. 
how important is that lack of global leadership in terms of a, a final resolution of the crisis? It's very important because today interdependence of the global economy implies that problems are global and national policies have international spillover. So you cannot resolve international problems at the national level. You need international policy coordination and cooperation. Unfortunately, the great powers of the world, whether it's advanced economies or emerging markets, have different economic systems, different political systems, and even those who have similar systems, like the West, disagree. They disagree on monetary policy, on fiscal policy, on global current accounting balance balances, on currencies, on how to reform the international monetary system, how to well supervise banks and financial institutions, on global climate change, on international trade liberalization, let alone on the important geopolitical issues of the time, say Syria and others. So in that sense, I've argued that the G20 has become more of a G0 world, that it's a forum for disagreeing rather than reaching agreements on a wider set of important issues on which that international coordination of policy and international policy governance is fundamental and necessary in this interdependent world. And I think we certainly saw an evidence of that in the recent G20 meeting in, St. Pe in Petersburg. Indeed. Mr. Rubini, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Pleasure being with you today.